make claims as if they are just the way things are, but that's only because you're not aware of or taking account of broader historical trends. Do you think it's going to be possible to get all of these um, these hyper focused groups to buy into a meta structural analysis when it will mean, in their worldview, diminishing the importance of the thing that they've been so focused on? Well, that's, that's a good question. And in fact, that's actually a problem the left has now, even though they sort of all live within the ecosystem of the broader historical Marxist perspective, there's the ongoing debate, why does my revolution have to wait for your revolution to happen? Mm. And so they haven't solved that problem. It's not a problem that's going to necessarily go away. But I think what it will lead to, though, is a sense that Nature abhors a vacuum, and if you can fill that vacuum with something, it will kind of create its own gravitational pull around it so that people will be drawn to it because it helps better contextualize what they themselves are saying. And so that's why I think Marxism has such a huge pull on the left, is whether you're an anar you know an anarchist, a feminist, a third world you know activist, or whatever, whatever, that still frames your entire position, even if you want to say that, well, my particular pet project is most important. It's still mm. rooted in that broader uh, picture. I, I have noticed this uh, as a cognitive trap a lot of people fall into. For example, um, does the economy run on free market principles or is there a central command and control um you know, infrastructure that's ultimately uh, the, the only thing that matters. And surely the answer is somewhere in the middle, that there are free market principles that take part in certain regards. And in other regards, you know, how you divide that up could be the discussion. But everybody ends up falling on one side or, or, or the other. Um, so how do we fight against this trap towards oversimplifying um, and, and, and um, just kind of plead with people to, <laughs> to to accept that the world is complicated. Yeah, right. So the, the, the problem is they'll be like, well, this this mode of analysis that I specialized in, and, and we see this all the time, right? So the libertarian rights like, well, look, the most fundamental analysis is individual choice. And so while they may acknowledge or may not acknowledge these other like maybe group or collective uh, pressures, they'll say, well, the most important are the choices of individuals. Mm -hmm. And then with the intermediate level of analysis, you know, the uh, the alt-right will say, well, no, it's race is the most important, or the MRAs will say that sexual selection is the most important. But re regardless, though, all of those statements have to be conceived in a prior conceptual framework for them to even make sense. And so what is that con prior conceptual framework now, in the modern age, since almost all of this analysis is the result of uh, modern experiences, is the economic boom and production glut of the post-1945 era under globalism. And all of these things that they're observing are taking place within that sort of material economic framework, and then, you know, within the philosophical framework of well, a whole bunch of different mishmash of things. I mean, you know, you get everything from Nietzsche and Stirner, you know, to elements on the far right to, you know, Evola, you know, traditionalists, and, and then, you know, Catholics and, and so on and so forth. So the intellectual background is very wide as well. But these are all that are assumed or what we might call unstated assumptions that are having. And so the, what, what needs to happen is the, the envelope of the discussion needs to move to the unstated assumptions. The, how significant it is is it that the um, unifying principle then amongst these groups on the on the left it is the writings of one person? It's seen as Marxism, possibly Marxism Leninism, you know. But it's it, it, it's obviously the um, at this point it's a corpus of thinking from lots of people who've who've done further analysis through time, um, to the point where it seems to me often that these terms like working class or imperialism um, actually 
bear little resemblance to what Marx himself was using them to mean. But nonetheless, there's this feeling of the accumulation around a, a central um, theory because of the common use of, of jargon and the, um, you know, each specialist group can kind of reinterpret the language in, into their own context. Yeah, exactly. So the, the first point, yeah, to what extent are people using these words today in the sense that Marx would himself use them? Probably very differently than the way Marx would have used them. But but nonetheless, what it see, what it does do is it does create a shared sense of language and concepts in order to communicate. So so let's sort of circle this back to a classic uh, right wing critique of the left. They'll say, well, the problem with one one problem with diversity is that if if I have any issues or set of concerns that I need to get other people to understand, conceptualize, and pay attention to, I need to go through all this effort of translating my ideas, my thoughts, my jargon into thoughts, language, and jargon that you can understand, and then hope mm. that it sticks so that you can be my ally in this fight. And there's so many intervening steps that are full of so many risks of you know not coming through that you just end up having people that can't effectively communicate with each other such that it's very difficult to build this conceptual uh, work that the, that it's analogous in any way to the left. Now, if we had that, we could just say, okay, we're just going to default to this, and everybody sort of would know what that would be uh, on the right. But again, currently that doesn't exist. There, there almost seems a, a strange contradiction in the fact that um, leftist thought has this rich, backwards-looking almost reverential approach where they say, you know, Lenin looked back to Marx and Marx looked back to Hegel and you could almost trace it back to like Plato. Uh, whereas the right, which is theoretically is reactionary, nonetheless feels the need to reinvent their theory from the ground up every generation. Yes, yes, they, they feel the need to reinvent the wheel every generation. Now, we, we speak in terms of with the right within the 20th century. I think what you, you mentioned Plato, right? So in a lot of ways, especially if you read Plato's Republic, especially the part where he talks about, you know, collectivism and the noble lie and the, the birth lotteries, that all sounds like very proto-socialistic. And certainly some socialists arguably got some inspiration from that. They also got inspiration from Renaissance Catholic writings like Thomas More's Utopia and Campanella's The City of the Sun. I think what the right would need to do for a kind of like, quote, deep history route would be to be somehow rooted in Aristotle, because Aristotle takes a more biological and organic position, uh, whereas Plato takes a more theoretical and abstract position. And with regards to political science, if we look at Edmund Burke's uh, reflections on the French Revolution, he says that, you know, uh, you can't build a commonwealth on a priori thinking. You have to do it a posteriori. And so he... Uh, Aristotle would agree. That's that's an Aristotelian conception of political science, whereas Plato having has an a priori view of political science, where you imagine this ideal city and then impose it onto the world, and so that's where we would begin to see some of the differences. Hmm.